Welcome back to Five Acres Honey Farm. I'm Tara Lynn. Before we get started, I just want to remind folks that um, my blog, which is dedicated to natural beekeeping, permaculture, and nutrient-dense food, is approaching its one-year anniversary. And I have a new announcement coming out every week on the blog. So if you haven't um, checked it out, I'm linking to that below. I also wanted to share, I went to the Smoky Mountain Beekeepers club meeting for the first time. I've been on the email list for a few years, but I haven't been able to go in person. And I won this mug um, in the raffle. So it's kind of a nice uh, little first time visit there. And it was a really great speaker. Um, it was Bob Benny from um, Blue Ridge Honey in North Georgia. So I really want to go check out that shop. Um, and he has a YouTube channel as well. So I'll link to that. Um, I just subscribed to it. I don't know how I hadn't known about it before. Um, but today's video uh, is about um, how I've lost colonies over the years and I am approaching, um, by the time this posts, it'll probably be the week of my seven year beekeeping anniversary. So I'm just moving into my eighth year keeping bees here in North Carolina. So I'm currently at my apiary just west of Bryson City um, near Lake Fontana and uh, my other apiary um, is in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, just south of Chapel Hill. And uh, right now I've got these two colonies out here and you can see I actually have an entrance reducer on the ground um, next to this one and that's a small hive beetle um, entrance reducer where it prevents them from getting inside. And I have it on the ground right now because I had a pollen trap um, on this colony a few times this week when, when it wasn't raining and some really cool birds flying around. Um, so I, um, I am gonna be um, going through the colony um, today, not into too great detail because I, I split this colony um, about a month ago and they were not successful in creating a new queen. So a week ago, I gave them a frame of beautiful eggs. Like it was just solid eggs all around. So they have a lot of options to create some queen cells and I don't want to disturb their queen making. So I'm just going to be doing a few minimal things in there. But while I am in there, I'm going to be putting that small hive beetle um, entrance reducer back on. So aside from that though, related to small hive beetles, um, that's actually one of the ways that I've lost colonies. Um, and I've been documenting my small hive beetle saga in many videos. I really should just compile them into a small hive beetle um, playlist. Um, perhaps I'll do that at some point. Um, but it was my first fall keeping bees out here where the, like, the beetles had been a problem, but then they just really took over and there was really a, a lot of the colony had absconded and the queen was left with like a handful of bees. Um, and I tried to, um, to get her um, some more um, worker bees. I moved her back to my other um, apiary, um, but she didn't make it, a, a, you know, a few more weeks. The other, the other bees did accept her, but it became a little too cold too quickly, and they weren't able to, um, to sustain that. So that's one way that I've lost colonies is with the small hive beetles. I feel like last year I was successful at managing them. They're already surfacing again, um, but now I feel like I know the ways to help mitigate their pressure. So I'm not as um, scared um, as I was this, this time last year. And then the other nice thing is that um, my qu one queen here who made it through the winter is my first queen to make it through the winter here. So knowing that she was able to be resilient enough that um, hopefully this next queen that this colony will make will have that, those great genetics. And I'm very tempted also to make another, um, make a nuke or potentially two nukes um, just to help foster her genetics here and to give more opportunity for um, for her lineage to um, to continue. However, I have, I believe, another video. Um, I may not have put it out yet. I can't remember um, about um, spacing colonies further apart and, um, and in more of an effort to keep hives in their um, more in like a wild like wild like fashion. And um, and so it really um, it would kind of be going against that principle if I keep adding more colonies right to this area. And so, um, but I have mentioned that um, I'm planning on doing like a remote apiary. Um, so I'm just learning a bit more about like bear proofing and things like that. So another way that I have lost colonies is through getting robbed out 
and um, and that's happened a few different ways um, one particular way was a big surprise and I may have shared this in another video um, but I had a carpenter bee drill a hole straight through the hive body right where one of like the little handle spots are and all the other bees were able you know non whether it was other honeybee colonies or you know non honeybees were able to just go right in and within a day or two there was nothing left like it was like the, the wax was like ripped to shreds um whatever was robbing it was eating the brood the nectar everything um, and now i'm very vigilant about it hasn't happened again but I'm, i always like check over the colonies to see like did any carpenter bee get in here and um, and if I do see that happen again, I will very quickly replace the box or plug it immediately. And another way that I have lost a colony has been nutritionally related. And this was in the time um, when I would do a lot more supplemental feeding um, with pure cane sugar syrup. And, um, and now I do, if I have to feed, I create a BT and I have a separate video about how um, I make the BT. Colony, it was, it wasn't really like, it didn't look like a foul brood, but like the, there was something wrong with the brood. It was chalk brood. And I had one of the state apiary inspectors come out and had diagnosed that. So I hadn't known that's what it was until um, she had explained. And, um, and so the treatment for that would be to really give them as much um, pollen supplements as possible to help boost their nutrition and their immunity. Um, so I had to order certain pollen, feed them. Um, there was slight improvement, but they didn't make it another month. It was also at a very precarious time of year where I feel like um, out of any time of the year, that's the time of the year that I would lose a colony is the fall. Um, I feel, you know, looking back, I haven't had consistent winters where I lose colonies. Um, summers aren't you know i'm very vigilant about having small entrances so like robbing isn't as much of a threat in the summer um but the fall is when you really have to keep an eye and make sure they have the right food and that their brood look healthy and all of that um, but that was the only time that i experienced it and um, based on what she had shared with me um you know that that particular condition isn't transferable <clears throat> in the equipment so I had just, as I do with all my equipment, I, you know, froze it for a few days up to a week and then stored it and I continue to use that equipment. I've also lost colonies related to, I would just call it Varroa related conditions. Um, I had another time where the colony just wasn't looking right. Um, very poor production. Um, the bees just didn't have a lot of energy. They had food, but it, it just didn't seem right. So, and I also saw a lot of dead bees in front of the colony, which made me think they were potentially um, poisoned by pesticides. So um, in those situations, you don't want to disturb the, the hive too much, um, at least, and then this, this may be different in other countries, but, um, and maybe other states as well. But here in North Carolina, um, we have um, state apiary inspectors assigned to specific regions of, of um, the state. And if you have any issues, they can come out and there is no cost to that. Um, our tax dollars pay for it. So you can have them come out and help you diagnose things anytime. And, um, and so the colony um, very quickly um, just died out and there was just a pile of bees in front of the, the colony. In which case you wanna treat it kind of like a crime scene. You don't wanna be cleaning up and all that. You know, you do typically wanna clean up so that if it was something that could be transferred to another um, colony, you're kind of running that risk. Um, but usually the state apiary inspector can come within a day or two. So, and they did. And when they looked over the dead bees, um, they didn't even want to take a sample for a pesticide test because um, after inspecting the dead bees and doing a little bit of a, an alcohol shake on them, um, it was tremendous mite load. So it was just a huge mite infestation. I've shared in other videos that I've had really poor um, success rates with doing alcohol washes and I don't really rely on them anymore. Um, same with sugar shakes. So I don't do routine Varroa counts. Um, I really rely on splitting <clears throat> and having those brood breaks um, and then doing um, organic inputs um, and chemical free inputs like um, oxalic acid vaporization, Apigard, um, and and really trying to split 
and encourage that, that brood break period. I haven't had a dead out um, related to Varroa since that time, which was several years ago. So I feel like the, um, the approach that I'm taking now has helped them. I mean, they're still going, so, and they, they look really great and they're, they're producing really well. Time for a little change in scenery because little Indy just shocked himself on the electric fence. So he's now calmly relaxing on the porch. Um, so I think I was just chatting about queen failure. Um, so um, all of the queens that I have now are descendants from the very first queen that I had. Um, and, um, and some of you may know, I name all my queens and I go through the alphabet. So um, right now I am up to J and this is my second time through the alphabet. So it's taken me um, seven years um, to get through um, that many um, queens. And I only name queens if they have successfully mated. So there have been queens that have been um, reared who failed so I do not name those, so just keeping that in mind too. So I have, um, I've acquired two nukes over the years, so that was um, uh, instances where I've introduced other um, queen genetics, um, and you know, they you know, had thrived for a little while, maybe a year or two, um, and not just those queens, but actually like their descendants, but, um, but when I look over my notes, like I keep very detailed um, charts for, you know, which queen is related to who, and, um, and none of the other genetics that I've introduced have um, sustained, um, they've all, their lineage, uh, their lineages have ended. <laughs> so I also had a friend give me a swarm um, in the past few years, and it was a great colony, and I had also, you know, had split them, I think, at one point, um, or created a nuke from them, um, but again, that lineage did not persist. So, um, you know, I do know that other beekeepers, I know, sweetie, um, other beekeepers will um, routinely look for more genetics to introduce, particularly for like Varroa sensitive hygienic um, or the Minnesota um, hygienic queens um, to make sure that you are, um, you know, keeping that the stock that kind of like helps to manage Varroa um, because like over time, that genetic pool kind of gets diluted with whichever drones they're mating with in the area. So there could be, you know, other beekeepers who don't have great genetics nearby. And so your queen, your new queens are going to go out and mate with those, um, which is why it's really great to help encourage um, your, your local beekeepers to, um, to keep good stock so that you can all benefit from it. In any case, um, I have had um, whether it's nukes or colonies, just um, fail over time um, related to queen issues. I have had on more than one occasion um, colonies die out from brood chill where they just didn't have enough coverage and it was really cold and they did not make it through. The brood chill part does kill like their next generation, which means then their whole population is um, is not going to be as they're not going to be able to be as warm <clears throat> as it continues to get colder and given that you know it's about three weeks for you know worker bees to emerge um, and if the temperatures are dropping there and the queen may you know um, slow down laying in the fall and so all those things combined um, you know I've had some colonies just not make it through those um, initial you know colder days of fall or they didn't have a strong enough population um, to get through the cold times of, of winter. I have seen in my colonies deformed wing virus. Um, I haven't, and, and it doesn't alarm me so much. It just more of is an indicator to me that there is a varroa issue. Um, it, I don't see it very often. Um, it's usually with drones. So then it's, it's hard to know, like, is this drone from this colony? Because drones do drift between colonies and maybe from other bee yards as well. So you don't know, um, like where the source of the issue is, um, necessarily. If I do see something like that, it makes me, um, kind of, uh, prioritize, um, you know, a Varroa treatment, um, not just in the one colony where I saw it, but in all of them, <laughs> just, um, just to kind of as, as a um, kind of a reactive preventative in, in a way. Some issues that I have not dealt with, so I have not lost colonies, um, so I don't have experience with this, and I know other beekeepers who have, but tracheal mites, nosema, and fowl brood issues. I don't personally know anyone who's experienced American fowl brood, 
but I know um, some beekeepers who've experienced European fowl brood and they were successful in treating it and their colony, you know, kept thriving. So um, overall, um, there, you know, I haven't had anything wacky, crazy, unrealistic happen to the colonies. And these are things that, you know, with each experience, you, um, you know, you have a little bit of a different perspective on how to, um, you know, how to manage the colonies to prevent issues like the ones that I've described. Um, and th these, those are, these are all manageable things, you know, if, if with um, chalk brood, you know, making sure they have, you know, prime nutrition, um, you know, I only take a third of um, their honey harvest um, each, you know, if, we're, if I'm only from colonies that really produce an ex excess as well. So it's not like, you know, they go to all that work creating honey, which has so much great nutrition for them, and then they are just stuck eating sugar syrup. Like, they have what they need, they have what they've produced. And, um, and also, you know, I don't, I haven't, since that chalk brood incident, I haven't leaned on any pollen substitutes at all. And, um, and as I've shared in other videos, this is my first year where I am um, selectively harvesting pollen from certain colonies. And, um, and so that I'm very cognizant about where I'm not doing that in excess. And I'm also not doing it from all colonies. I'm just picking a few to, um, you know, just to kind of test out how much pollen can come in and also making sure that they have adequate pollen in the colony before I do that. So really making sure that they're set up for success with the right nutrition, making sure that I am, and I'm a little bad about that right now, um, is, um, is keeping up with splits. Um, so, you know, my other apiary right now has some monster colonies and I've been out here <clears throat> in the mountains for over a week and I really would have liked to have split my other colonies before I left. So I am nervous that there may be a, a swarm or two when I get back. Um, and there was so much honey in there, so I'm like really nervous that they're gonna take it all. Um, but um, it was just a risk I had to take based on timing, weather, and I'm running out of equipment. So I need to, um, to, go, to go in and get some more equipment. Um, so those are just like all those little factors that, that pile up. Um, and those are things that like I could have um, planned a little bit better for, usually over the winter. I buy extra equipment just to have it on hand so that I'm not in these situations. And this was the first winter where I'm like, I'll be fine. I've got all this stuff here. Um, you know, at, um, at my other apiary, I've got so many supplies here, but I'm actually at a point where I am pulling supplies from this apiary and bringing it back because the colonies here at this time last year were massive and um, and since I just split this one they're they're kind of like slowly building up but um, but it's happening so um, so yeah so there's there's a few um, various ways and as you can also tell from what I've shared there's no like consistent like I constantly keep losing hives based on Varroa or I'm constantly losing to brood issues or you know it's different things bubble up um, you know different colonies you know, just like people have, you know, different strengths and weaknesses, something to, to kind of learn from. And also just keeping in touch with local beekeepers to see what issues they're running into so that you can kind of keep a better watch on things. The other thing I wanted to share, if you're still um, here at the closing of the video, I know I, I um, myself, like once I get to close to the end of videos, I'm like, all right, time to go. Um, so if you are still here, um, I have another video about things that I would have liked to have learned before I started beekeeping. So I am linking that below and I will share more next time. Thanks.